thing. I don't forget that you can always just switch to a different um, virtual terminal. So if I hit Control Alt F4, I'll switch over just to a, a different virtual terminal. And I can log in over here, just hit the text console, and then I can hit Man DWM and just get a manual that will show you, you know, a whole bunch of things about DWM and how to use it, and most notably the all the keyboard commands. And the one that we really care about is this mod one shift return. Uh, so this one will start the, if you have the suckless terminal installed or the simple terminal ST, uh, or it'll just use your uh, default terminal. So this mod one shift return will just open that up. So that's really the most important thing that we need uh, back in DWM in the, in the GUI, because we can just bring up the man page again if we want to switch back over. Uh, so I will just close the, this virtual terminal and switch back over to DWM here. And I can hit uh, Shift-Alt-Enter. And now I've got a terminal. And then I can do command you know, DWM again and, and look. Uh, so Alt-Shift-Enter, you'll notice that, so I did it twice there, I'll do it again. So now I've got four of these windows open. And in your typical uh, window manager, you'll see that usually it'll be what's called a floating uh, windows, where everything is, you kind of have to position things how you want them to, and you can drag them around. Uh, but with DWM and other tile window managers, they position the windows for you in a tile. Uh, and that makes it really, really easy to you know, manage these windows and to resize them and take up all of your, your screen real estate, uh, and that sort of thing. So any, any questions so far on that? Does that make sense? So you you would use this over, uh, have you ever used TMUX before? I have, yes. Do you like this better than you do TMUX? So TMUX is slightly different because TMUX only works with text. It only works inside your terminal. So I can, for example, start a Firefox. Um, and then now Firefox is in here. Uh -huh. So, you know, TMUX can't uh, manage all of these different windows. It can only manage text within one terminal. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so, some other uh, cool key bindings. Um, so, this, what I just did is you can, you can just click on any of these windows, and if you hit Alt, Enter, it will uh, move it to this, what they call the master. Uh, side, and then this other side is the slave side. Um, but all of these are detailed out in the man page, so if you want to dig through yourself, you can look at all these different key bindings. Uh, you can do cool things like uh, move windows from the left side to the right side, and make things bigger or smaller. Um, so, and it's all driven by the keyboard, which is really very handy. Uh, and it has a couple of different modes, too. Um, so, for example, if you miss having your windows floating, you can uh, click on this little button up here, and you can switch to the floating mode. So you have tiling and floating. And then you can just drag windows around by holding Alt and clicking on it. And then you can resize your window by using the, the right click mouse button and uh, you, know, you can drag them around just like your, your typical windows. Mm. Uh, and one cool thing about this whole system is that it's very, very uh, minimal. Uh, so compared to Gino, uh, this is only a few hundred lines of C code. Uh, so you don't necessarily get all the bells, whistles, and features that you get under you know full desktop environment. Um, but this is really nice for systems that don't have a lot of resources or things where you just want to be lean and uh, you know, dig in and get some work done. And then I can get all or I can click on this again to go back to the time mode. Cool. Any questions so far? Awesome. Uh, and then, so something else that's interesting about DWM that I haven't seen in other uh, desktop environments is the idea of up here, uh, typically, if you click on all these different numbers, it sort of looks like different workspaces that you'll see in other desktops. But here, um, these are actual tags. 
So it's sort of like a, a workspace on a desktop, but you can have a window on multiple tags at the same time. So for example, this, um, this you know, man page that has all of the important information on how to use DWM, I can pin it to multiple tags. So I can put it on one and uh, I can also put it on two and three and four and five just by clicking on this and you know holding down alt and uh, you know clicking with different mouse buttons as specified here in the man page. So as you can see, you know it's not necessarily the most intuitive uh, to start because you have to remember a bunch of different buttons, and a bunch of different key bindings, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it makes doing your computing really uh, fast and seamless once you kind of understand you know, all of these different things you can do. And that's kind of the DWM in a nutshell, um, except for one important part is we showed how to start terminals by hitting shift alt enter. But if you want to start a command, you hold alt P, and that brings up something called D menu, uh, which is what uh, Steve Lett has talked about in the past before. Because um, you can run this really on any um, on any window any, any window manager. It's just a program that pops up at the top. Uh, but it lets you say, if I want to start typing in F I R E F O X, I can start Firefox or um, you know, Chrome or you know whatever else you have installed. It's just a you know very fast way to uh, you know na navigate the menu to start up programs. is DWM in a nutshell. Um, if you notice too that there isn't really any kind of configuration here, like there's no settings panel or uh, way to change how everything works, uh, how they expect you to uh, work with DWM is actually to modify the source code. Uh, so the DWM source is pretty small and short, so uh, there's like a configuration file that you can modify to change colors and change how things how things work, but you have to recompile the program uh, to get all of that uh, changed over if you actually want to make changes, which is kind of a weird way uh, for these things to be set up. And that's part of the reason why there are some uh, derivatives of this and forks like Awesome Window Manager and i3 and uh, Xmonad and a few others where they actually took DWM source code and they added in ways to make it easily configurable and extensible and add more features and that sort of thing. Uh, so next I can go into how to configure DWM and a little bit of Git or I can show you some cool things you can do with uh, DMenu. I don't know if you guys have any preference or any questions so far. All sounds good to me. All right. Uh, I guess I'll start with just uh, I'll start with configuring DWM a little bit. Uh, so let me just reset uh, this machine here. I almost forget how to do that. There we go. So I'm just going to go back to a clean, just a clean install and kind of throw away everything we've done so far. So if I come in here. Notice we're just back to only having the default Ubuntu sessions. So the, the real way that you're supposed to be using DWM is by using the source code, like I was saying before, and not uh, just installing a package. So what I'm going to do is uh, first, if you come into your the software update uh, program in Ubuntu, you can check this little source code button here. And you have to type in the password, don't look. And then that will just uh, allow you to start downloading source code from the Ubuntu repositories. So once that updates. And what that actually did, um, if you're curious, if you look at um, the app sources list file here, it just enabled these dev dash source lines, which added these new um, 
options essentially for apps to download source packages instead of just the typical binary packages. So in order to interact with the source packages, you do need one other um, one other package, which is called the package dev. I think. So if I install that real fast, yep. So that'll take just a few seconds because it's going to download uh, some of the you know little dependencies that you need to be able to deal with sources from a Debian system like Ubuntu. So now what I can do is make a dir for dwm, change into it, and then I can do uh, apt-get source and dwm. And now that actually downloads the source package. Um, so I actually have source code in here. And I can come into this dwm uh, 6.1 file folder, and I can see I have you know the, the C source code and headers and a make file and all the things that Ubuntu or Debian would use to create the binary package that we install. And if I open up this configuration file here, this config.def.h, right here, Oops, I didn't have that installed. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of configuration here. So I can change fonts and colors, and uh, if I want the bar, instead of it being at the top, if I want it to be at the bottom, then I can just change this one to a zero, for example, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so I'll do that. I'll just put the top part at the bottom because that makes it easy. And then to apply that, to actually use this package, now I have to actually build it. Um, so if I do a make uh, install, or just do a make here, it's going to complain that I don't have a bunch of things installed and I'm missing dependencies and that sort of thing. Uh, but luckily, Debian also makes that really easy uh, to build from the source packages because it knows all the dependencies because it needs them to be able to uh, build the packages that it will ship when it ships the binary packages. So I can just do a sudo um, app-get build devs in DWM. So that will actually download all the build dependencies that DWM needs to be able to build it from source. Oops. Sorry, it's sudo add to build yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, there's no S there, build that. So that installs some packages here. And now if I do a make, it'll go through and everything's good and uh, builds everything that we need. So that's one really nice thing is if you ever find that you have, if you're using like a Debian system or um, a Linux like this, that if there's a package that has something that's uh, not quite what you want and you want to change the code you know, slightly to change it to do something that you want differently, it's really, really easy to download the source package, download the dependencies, and then just build it yourself. Hmm. Uh, so if I do a sudo make install, this will install it to uh, all the different places. So if I do a which DWM, you can see that now it's in user local bin DWM. So if I log out of here and click here, you'll notice, hey, something's missing. Uh, why is DWM not there? So we missed something back here. If I open up the terminal again, and I go back into our DWM folder, and back into the source, uh, there's this Debian folder in every uh, package. And if I go into Debian and I look at this uh, control file, this control file essentially tells you how to install a package. Uh, and digging through this, uh, you'll find that it calls into this uh, DWM install file. And this file actually copies over a couple of files over to user share X sessions and user share icons. So the reason it didn't show up in our sessions is because we're missing something from this desktop folder in X sessions. So we can just copy that over manually 
uh, and get that set up. So if I do a desktop, data on your desktop, and I move that over to user, user share extensions. And then now, I'm just going to reboot real quick. You'll see that we should have a DDO, DWM menu item. I can log in here, and you can see that since we changed the source code, now the bar is at the bottom instead of at the top. So any questions around that? I know I kind of went, went quick through that, but I'm happy to answer any questions or walk back through anything. Very um, the, the source code, there's not too much to, to the source code. It's just like a few files, and that's it. <laughs> really small. Yep. Yeah, it's, it is. And, and that's one very cool thing about the Suckless. Uh, um, their kind of ethos is they believe that all code is bad, and so they're trying to make better code by writing less of it. Uh, so their programs are usually very small and simple, and don't have very many features because they think that that will then make it easier to focus and make the code itself better. So this is also a good introduction into uh, uh, contributing to uh, open source projects as well then. A little bit, a little bit, yeah. Um, so, so uh, yeah, it's at least a, a good way to start getting started in if you want to, you know, modify the packages that are coming down from your system, or if you want to even just look at them so that you can kind of see what's going on because you're curious about, you know, what, uh, when you install, you know, Firefox or Chrome or that sort of thing from a, a Debian package, you know, what's actually in there. Um, so That's cool. cool. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, and... So I, I guess from there, I can go a little bit into, uh, so we just made a change into the DWM. So how do we know what we changed? Um, so after a while, you know, you're digging through here, and you're making a bunch of modifications, and you come back six months later, and you say, oh no, you know what did I change? There's a new version of DWM, and I want to uh, start using that, but I made all these changes, and I want to you know, maybe make those same changes to the new. Uh, new version. Uh, so the one good way to do that is with something called version control. And Git is a very popular type of version control uh, that's used to manage changes in uh, source code or text or really anytime you need to track uh, things that are in plain text. So unfortunately, uh, since we already made a change here, it's hard to then track changes after you've made the change. Um, but luckily, we didn't make anything too big of a change. We just moved the top bar to the bottom bar. Uh, so if I change that back, this is the, you know, the, the state that we started initially. Um, but now I'm going to install git here really quick. So sudo apt install git. So that will install git. And Git can get very, very complicated very fast, um, but when you use it kind of in its base form, it's pretty simple. Uh, to start a new project, so we have all the source code that we want to start tracking the changes in, I can do uh, git init, and then I pass it the path, which is just dot, so I'll do git init dot. And then if I do git status, it'll say, hey, you have all of these different files that um, we can start watching, we can start tracking the changes up if you'd like to. Uh, and looking at this, I noticed that uh, there are a few things in here that are we maybe don't want to track because they came from the build that we did earlier. So like these .o files are uh, intermediate files from when we were making DWM earlier. So we can maybe clean those up first before we start tracking files. So if you just do a make clean, and now when we do a get status, you'll notice that those .o files disappeared. Uh, so now we can start adding these files. So I can do git add and say I want to start tracking the 
this config uh, that I initially changed. So I can do git add config. And notice now this new file is, is set to be tracked soon. Um, but with git, you make all of your changes first. And then once you're, once you're happy with uh, you know, the different changes that you made, you can then commit them. So uh, right now, this actually isn't being tracked yet until I run git commit, which will then um, commit my intention and will actually start tracking the file. Uh, but I want to track all of them, so I can just do git add dot. And if I do a git status, it'll show, OK, hey, look, all of these things are now being tracked. So if I do a git commit, um, oh, there's just a, it wants me to set up some user information here. So I'll just set this to the nuts and stuff there. Uh, but if I do a git commit, now it opens up an editor. Uh, and you can write out a message about uh, what change you just made. So this is just the initial setup, the initial commit. Um, so we didn't really make any changes, but we're just starting the tracking process. So I'll, I'll save that. Yes, and then commit. So now if I do get status, it says there's nothing to commit. Everything is as it is. But if I were to make another change, so if I look at this config file, and I were to change the top bar here to zero again, and then I do get status. It'll say, hey, you modified this, this config file. And there's another command called git diff that will then show you the exact change that happened. And if I want to save that, I can then commit the change. Uh, and then you get a whole uh, history of all the changes that you made. So if I add that file, so I'll git add config. And then I'll commit it and say, I moved the top bar to the bottom. And then I can save it. And now we'll see that there are no changes again. And I can do git log, and that will show all of the different things that I've done so far uh, to this code. So I can see that I had my initial commit, which was just the, the source code that we pulled out. And then I made a change here, which is move the top part to the bottom. So any questions so far? Does that make sense? Yeah, you could also use this with GitHub, right? Yes. Yeah, so GitHub is a way to host your, um, your code. So I can actually um, push this code up to GitHub, and they can post all of my code for me. And people can collaborate and uh, push code and do all kinds of different things and share code and, and that sort of thing. But it's all based on Git. What about Launchpad? So Launchpad is slightly different. Um, Launchpad is is a canonical. Um, so canonical makes Ubuntu, and it's a it's a it, it does what Git does, GitHub does, where it can host code and you can collaborate. Uh, but Launchpad also has a build server built into it, so it builds all of the packages that Ubuntu uses. Um, so, like Debian, for example, is uh, all of the packages are built by maintainers and contributors to Debian, uh, whereas with Ubuntu, all of the packages are built by their massive uh, build farm that lives on Launchpad. Hmm. So you get, uh, and, and that's part of the. You know the things, the differences behind having Canonical, which is a you know corporate sponsor of Ubuntu, versus a more uh, community feel of something like Debian. But the Launchpad and GitHub can do some some similar things. Oh, okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Cool. Uh, yeah. So that's and then I guess one other thing too is if you decide, hey, I didn't like having the top bar at the bottom. I want to revert that change. I want to get rid of it. Uh, you can actually just do. You can grab this right here, which is the hash. It's the unique identifier for this commit, and you can just type git revert, and then you just paste in that hash, and then hit enter, and it will. Uh, every single change that you make to a git repository has to be done through a commit, 
um, with which is like logged and has a comment about it. And that, that's one of the great things about it is everything's tracked. Uh, so even though you're you're essentially removing a commit, it's going to put a new one on top to log the history of a commit being removed. Uh, so I will save this here. Now if I do a git log, you'll see we get the initial commit, and then we move the top bar to the bottom, and then we didn't like that, so then we reverted it and got rid of it. And if I open up that config, um, actually, this is config, you can see that the top bar is still at the bottom. Er, Changed it back from zero to one. Um, oh, uh, actually, that's one sticking point that I forgot. If you guys do end up working with DWM and you want to play with it, uh, it has these two config files: config.dev.h and config.h. So config.h is generated from config.dev.h. Uh, so in between builds, you'll want to modify this. Um, the config.dev.h, and then you can delete the config.h, or uh, you just have to keep in mind that it's going to have this like second file that it's going to be generated from the config.dev.h. It's a little bit confusing, but once you start kind of playing with it, it'll uh, it'll make sense. And that's kind of the, the intro to get here. Uh, I have a little bit more time. I can start talking about um, some cool things you can do with dmenu if you guys are interested, or if you have questions, I can go into that. Alright, I guess uh, I will jump over to doing some cool stuff with dmenu. Uh, so like I said before, I'm just going to close this window here. A dmenu pops up at the top, so if I hold Alt-P, um, actually, oh, I'm sorry, we have to <laughs> We forgot to. So we installed the uh, DWM package from source, but uh, we never installed D menu. So if you see what app installed from menu. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, where D menu is really just an alias for the suckless tools. Um, so you can install either one, and you'll get the same same set of things. Uh, so if I hit Alt P, you see this thing pops up at the top, and it lets me start programs and like Firefox and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a lot more flexible than that. Uh, so if I do um, if I do something like um, I make a file here, and I or actually no, this is better. So I make a sequence. So like one, two, five. That prints, you know, the numbers one to five. And if I pipe that into uh, D menu, that will then give me a menu where I can select from any of those entries that were that were piped in. So I can do one, two, three, four, five. So I can do four, three, and then when I hit it, it will then return the number that I selected. Does that make sense so far? So it's a pretty simple tool. Um, it just lets you select from a set of uh, lines, essentially, that you pipe into it. Cool. Uh, let me just pull up something here real quick. All right, so uh, some cool things you can do with this. Uh, for example, I can make a very fast way to search in Firefox, for example, if I want to. Um, so dmenu can also just take in any kind of arbitrary uh, text. So if I just type uh, dmenu, you have to, if you're not actually taking in any, any input, uh, you have to type in dev null. But now I can just type in, you know, uh, max is cool. <laughs> that'll then print and max is cool here. Uh, but you can use that to do something like uh, I'll do dash, dash p for search. Uh, 
or so dash p lets you set a prompt. Uh, so now it's a search at the top. So I can say I'm going to search for a food bar. And then it prints it here. And now I can I can do something cool with that uh, where uh, I'll pipe that into XRs um, and I'll take one line of the output. So that's just going to take the first uh, thing that the D menu returns. And then I'm going to use that to uh, search Firefox. So there's some fancy, uh, some fancy um, syntax here that let, will let me replace these two characters with whatever I select in D menu. So I'm going to just start up Firefox. So I do Firefox. And then I do uh, HTTPS. I'll just do dot, dot, go. It's there. Pretty easy to use for this. And then I can just grab those same two characters here that I specified here. And now whatever I put into the menu will find whatever these two characters are here and we'll replace it and we'll go to this URL. So we'll go to HTTPS dot, dot, go, dot com. So I'll hit enter. So I can say I want to search for go look. And now I get a new Firefox window, and I search DuckDuckGo for Go. And so if I were to uh, bind this to a key binding or something like that, then that's a pretty cool short uh, shortcut where if you wanted to you know, search for something or, or do something with the main user, uh, pretty quick, easy way to do it. Any questions about that? So deep menu. Um... It's a uh, uh, it's it's used only on the in the terminal. No, no. So D menu can be used. Uh, so, for example, right now in um, DWM, uh, there's a a script called D menu run, and this script will pop up at the top, and it will let you select how to run Firefox, for example. And you can run Firefox. But uh, this D menu run is bound to a key binding. So if I hit Alt P, it runs D menu run. So it's both a terminal command, but you can run it from anywhere. Uh, and, and that way you can. Uh, so if you're if you're running really indie Windows Manager or a desktop environment, if you go into your settings, you can say, I want to run this command. Uh, when I press these keys, and it can be a D menu thing, and it's just a very quick and easy way to uh, select an option and do something based on that option. I see. Yeah. So some other use cases are uh, if you want to switch the wireless network that you're connected to, you can write a little script that will look at all the wireless networks that are in range, and then present you a list of uh, Networks to connect to, and then you can select one and then connect to them. So it's like a simple, uh, what do they call it, web scraper or a spider? So it's more like a, it's a very simple menu. Uh -huh. So it, it, what it does is it, you can say, I want the user to select you know, graphically or visually through one of these menu items, and then they can do something with that selection. Hmm. I see. So you can do it as a GUI, or you can do it on a terminal, and you can create scripts to run it on the terminal. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so, like one really uh, useful uh, use case for this is, say, you are uh, constantly having to manage a bunch of Linux servers, and you want to be able to SSH into them, you know, easily. You can write a D menu script. Uh, that will present you a list of um, a list of servers to connect to, and then you select one, and then it will open a terminal uh, connected to that server. Okay. So things like that. So it's just a, a way to um, you know kind of script around your uh, your environment, making you know really easy menus. I see. Do you use this a lot, Deep Menu? Uh, I do, I do. I think that Steve Litt may use it more than I do. Um, oh. I know 
he's always talking about different use cases for it. Um, he doesn't use DWM, but he does use DMenu, from what I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah, Steve also does ha has his own U menu. Yep. What's a U menu? Is Steve here? Yeah, he said he'd be in and out throughout the whole thing. Oh, um, it's it's just something that he created for himself. Oh, okay. Um, uh, it might it might be um. And his troubleshooters. Let me find the link. Yeah, I think that U menu may have been what he used before he found D menu, but I'm not sure. I think that they serve kind of similar similar use cases. But, cool. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of it. I do have one other uh, demo that I could go into that's a little bit more in depth with D menu. You guys are interested in that or uh, we can just wrap it up here that I'd be interested in seeing it okay we can do that uh, hold on just a second so just to show you an example of using this um, with something a little bit more complicated So I have, I'm going to uh, do a quick demo of um, a D-menu script that will let you select from a set of um, remote Telnet servers, and then it will, once you select one, it will then open it up in a terminal. Uh, that will make a little bit more sense here in a second. So I'll need to make two files here. So I'll have cool sites. Uh, and this one will just have, we'll do weather, uh, chess, and Star Wars. And just going to put in the URL for each of these. Oops. And then chess is freechess.org. And this one's on a different port, so we'll put that here. And then this one is dot blank. All right, so I've got three different servers I can connect to over Telnet. I've got, and I'm just going to select them by choosing weather, chess, or Star Wars. Any questions so far about kind of the general idea? Where are we going? Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to create a cool sites script. And this script will first, I'm going to ask the user for uh, which place they want to go to. Uh, and to. To do that, I'm going to look at that cool sites uh, file. And I'm just going to grab the, the first uh, entry in each one. So on the left side in that cool sites file. sites here. You can see, so I'm just going to grab this first entry uh, in the file. Oops, uh, I don't want to do that. Oops. So I'm just going to come back in here. Uh, so I'm just going to print out the, the first entry, each one, cool sites, and then I'm going to pipe that into dmenu, and I'm just going to say where to. And then just to make sure that that works, I'm just going to uh, echo out the place. So if we run this, if we run, um, so to run that, I have to make that file executable. So I do that by running chmod plus x, which adds the executable bit on the on the file, so I do chmod plus x, and now if I run the script, I can just do cool sites, and we get this where to, and weather or chess. And I can select that with the arrow keys, or I can start typing you know, w -V -A -T -H -E -R, and now it prints out weather. So that was our selection. Any questions?
questions so far? So next, I'm going to take that place, and I'm going to figure out what the URL was for it. Uh, so I'm going to have to look back at that file again, so these off here, which is a good tool for looking at files and doing text manipulation and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm going to use a little bit of some wizardry here. Uh, some, uh, it's a regular expression that will find. So this is like a search term uh, that will find the place. And when it finds the place, I want it to just print out uh, the URL. So that will be number two. And some of them have a, have a port. Uh, so it will be, you know, in the first, first case, we only want to print out the, the first entry on each line. And now we want to print out the, the second two, so two and three. And then mm -hmm. I'll do that to yeah. cool sites. And this dollar sign and dollar sign here, I want those to go to the, uh, I don't want this actually to make it to awk, so Bash will try and steal those symbols, uh, so we just have to escape here. So now if I echo the dollar sign URL, and we try and run this again, and say we choose chess this time, now it's going to print out freechess.org and then find those. So we're going to get the full URL entered. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Cool. And so the very, very last step will just be to open a terminal. And we're just using the no terminal still here. And I'm going to, in that terminal, open up a telnet session. And I'm going to give it the URL. And I'm going to run it in the back. That way, the DWM, this whole script can finish. And our talent session can go on, uh, and they don't have to worry about each other. So now, if I'm there is one thing done. Sorry, what was that? I'm oh, sorry. There is one thing done. There is one thing. Um, don't you need to put a space for the chest? Oh, is because that? it's going to do free chest dot five hundred instead of space five hundred. Yeah, that may be a problem. Hold on, is there? There should be a space here. Well, and we so, just lost you. Oh, yeah, you're right. So let's try running it real quick and see what that does. So if I do cool we, chat and then I run chess. We just lost your screen. Oh, you lost my screen? Yeah. There you go. Well, we see you. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so that is a problem. So there should be a space here. That's a good catch. So if I look at this here, uh, I think that I just need a comma between these two. So if I now echo dollar sign URL, I comment that out. If I just run cool sites and choose chess, now we have a space. So I was just missing, missing a comma. Then, so now if we run this whole thing, so now I can choose chess, and it should connect to you. Hold on, let's make that full screen. So now we've got chess. And if instead I wanted to do uh, Star Wars, I can kick that up. And now we can watch Star Wars every time. Or if I want to figure out what the weather is, I can choose Weather. And then I can uh, look at US, and then we are in CO, and then I can see the 94% humidity, 76 degrees. So it's a little bit contrived, but it's just kind of a cool example of fun things you can do uh, with the menu. So if I were to if I were using that in a production environment, instead of Telnet, it might be SSH, and instead of you know some of these fun uh, servers that we're connecting to, it may be a uh, you know some kind of production server or set of servers that I want to be able to switch between quickly. Uh, and then you can set a key binding uh, in your desktop environment to bring up that menu quickly, uh, and then you'll be able to you know, fire off these sessions really fast. Any 
questions? No, nope, that seems to be good. Question. Question. Yes. Have you gone over the uh, dash L and U menu to make them go vertically instead of horizontally? I have not. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a, a bunch of different things you can do here with, uh, with, the, with the menu. So there are a bunch of different options you can do. The one option we did talk about was dash P for prompt. Obviously, you can specify the prompt, uh, but dash L. So that's, we can, if we modify our cool sites script here, I can change uh, the D menu here. Instead of dash, dash P, I can do dash L. And now if I run cool sites, uh, that did not work. Oh, I have to specify the number of lines. Uh, so if I do three lines, for example, now, yeah. now you can see you've got multiple lines here, which maybe is a little bit easier to, uh, to parse depending on what, what you're doing. So if you have a whole bunch of different things, maybe having, or if the, if the strings are really long, the text, having it vertical instead of horizontal is helpful. I use that um, as, as a thing to select any executable on my path because D-Menu comes with something that looks on your path, finds every executable, puts it in an alphabetized line, and three or four or five keystrokes, and you've got your highlight where on the thing you want to run, and you just hit enter. It's by far the fastest way to run a program that there is. Yep. And that's the, the D-Menu run uh, that we saw a little bit earlier. With the yeah. And then, yeah. So if you... Are you menu Oh no. Oh no. Use D menu eighty percent of the time and U menu twenty percent of the time. If I had to give up one or the other, I'd give up U menu. Yeah, that D menu path is magical. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We can look at that real quick if you guys are curious about that too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Somebody knows how to write script, shell scripts. <laughs> you mentioned a uh, P parameter on D menu. Yes. What does that do? Uh, so if I do D menu dash P, uh, I can say. Uh, you can specify the prompt, so you can say who is the coolest. I'm oh, sorry. show how to use DWM and I missed it? You did. Yeah, we went over DWM, uh, modifying the source, tracking the changes a little bit we get, and then we went to D-Menu. It was all, you know, just, you know, kind of the, uh, moving through a lot, of, a lot of stuff pretty quickly. But. One thing is, I can't remember, is DWM uh, tiled or... Uh, yes. Yeah, we're actually using it right now. If you look at the, uh, if I open up some more terminals here, you can see gotcha. it. Yeah. It's a little bit ugly in its uh, native state, but some people go to great lengths to make these tile window managers uh, look very cool. This was excellent. Yeah, hopefully that was uh, interesting to you guys. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much. No, that's real good, David. Uh, 
it's got me starting to think about uh, contributing a little bit more to open source. That's good. That's good. Yeah, that's something that would, you know, we always need more people writing code. That's, that's one of the big reasons why uh, I'm passionate about this sort of thing is it's one of the only domains where, uh, you know, the entire world is essentially contributing to this big thing to better everyone. That's nice. So it's, it's a cool thing to be a part of. And you know, Max, it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing that you're doing. Uh, you know, I mean, a little shell script or something, if it does something really cool that people need, uh, it can be the start of it. I added a few Perl scripts and a few um, uh, Vim script things to uh, Vim, called it Vim Outliner, and it's in almost every distro now. And smarter people than me took it over and made it a lot better than I ever could have. And as a result, I have the uh, outliner of my dreams, and I only had to make a hack job. That's excellent. So that's similar to what Red Hat does, right? Well, Red, don't get me started. Why? What's wrong with that? They make they make a free distro like um, um, you know CentOS or, or or Fedora. Then they take that stuff and they put it in a uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise. Well, well. Uh oh, okay. I okay. I didn't open up some, did I? No. <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, Eric Raymond wrote a relatively little uh, C program called Fetchmail, and I use it every day, every three minutes. He wrote it 30 years ago. It's not maintained. Oh, dear. Yeah, because there's nothing wrong with it. It does the same thing that it did 30 years ago, and that's just what I need. Uh, it basically it, it retrieves all your mail from your um, uh, either your POP or IMAP server. Okay. And I and I and I think it also does it through um, if you have um, like Yahoo Mail and it's only accessible through the web part, it would still extract it. Yeah. You, you don't even need um, like a a POP um, domain. Yeah, okay. Fetchmail just grabs it from uh, any POP server or any IMAP server. And what I do, I have it walk it down. I have I have Fetchmail grab it. Wow, it's hard to it's hard it's hard to gesture in these things. Uh, it grabs it, pulls it in, then it sends it to Procmail, which jams it into the mail dir directory thing of a local dubcot server and then any email client that can do imap right which aren't all that many of them can look at my uh, dubcot server and look at it uh, and there are lots of benefits one thing is you know if you've got a pig like thunderbird well, at least it doesn't have to go out over a wire to access the IMAP. It just, you know, it's local. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it in the repositories. Yeah, it's not the easiest thing to set up. Dubcot isn't, but... Um, and that's the beauty of open source is, you know, you combine Eric Raymond's simple fetch mail with somebody else's simple proc mail with Dubcot, which is a piece of equipment. You know, it's not simple. And then just you throw in a, uh, you throw in an email client as a window into your IMAP and you've just assembled whatever you want. And you, you build it a la carte, you know, nobody's going to tell you, oh, you can't use this with that. Yeah, I mean, 
that's really the best part about all of this is that no one can really tell you not to do anything. You can be yeah. using something yeah. that hasn't been updated in 10 years and it still vibes. Did you discuss how efficient DWM is? Uh, just very, very briefly. But it is, it is uh, much, much more efficient than uh, something like Node or one of these other ones. The only frustrating part about it, though, is with a lot of applications now, they're expecting things like Dbus uh, sessions to be running or Pulse Audio or different things for, like for Firefox, for example. So if you're running DWM, uh, it doesn't set any of that up for you. So you have to you know, set those things up as you want them, but then you also have the choice of not setting them up if you don't want them. Whereas, you know, with Genome or that sort of thing, is you just get everything. You just get everything out of the box. Yeah, Genome is sort of like swimming around in a mixture of glue and molasses. Hey, um, as far as Pulse Audio, any application that needs it, needs its functionality, let's say Firefox, you just say A Pulse Space Firefox, Firefox. Some, kind some kind soul, soul wrote, something wrote something called A Pulse, a -pulse which, basically which basically gives whatever, gives whatever runs, under, runs underneath it, it full pulse, pulse audio, audio compatibility. compatibility. So, so you can have your your, your cake and eat it too. You can um, you can not you can not, that's really nice. yeah you can not, you you can not you dirty up your machine, machine with pulse audio. audio. And yet, when you have, you know, when somebody like Skype or Firefox demands you have it, well, you just use A Pulse. Um, as far as the Dbus thing, what I've noticed, of course, I don't use Genome or anything like that, but, you know, the worst thing it does, it throws an exception and puts a little, you know, a little message on your screen saying, oh, we couldn't access the bus. Big deal, Big deal, you know, it, it, still, it still works. works. Uh, if you don't use... Yes, yes sir. I was just going to say, where that comes in handy, having eBus is... Uh, so, projects like BlueZ, uh, for BlueZ, they have eBus bindings now where they have uh, features that are only available over the, the desktop bus. So, in some cases, you know, if you want to be able to do some fancy you know, Bluetooth things, you have to have D-Bus installed. Yeah. yeah. But luckily it's not quite as bad as, as setting up some of the other things. I, I'll admit, I have D-Bus, you know, because I just didn't want to fight all the battles. But I use it as seldom as I can. I don't use Network Manager or WICD or... You know, any of that stuff that uses D-Bus. And usually, I've found the stuff that uses D-Bus does a lot of other things that I don't like. I really don't like anybody changing the contents of my resolve.com except me. How'd you, how'd you get started with DWM? It's not usual.
I use Fluxbox. Some, um, I used to use Fluxbox. Yeah, that's a long memory. Yeah, that was the first one that I used. I remember way back in the day, back when I used Windows, and it was in 2004 or five. there was a Fluxbox uh, replacement for the Windows Explorer shells. I think they called it Black Box. So you could essentially run Fluxbox on Windows. And that was one of the big motivators for me to move off of Windows. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I wonder what I could do over on the Linux side where this came from. I kind of start. Is XFCE considered low uh, memory? Heck low yeah. Memory? Yeah. I use that with... Um, especially with these days. Especially what? I just said especially these days. Oh, okay. I, I, use I, don't, think, I don't think it's as low as uh, DWM or I3 or any of those, but mm -hmm. those, you know, I mean, those things are really bare bones. Um, so what's interesting is XFCE is a full desktop environment, so it contains a window manager, uh, and you can actually swap out that window manager for something like DWM. Uh, so uh, like DWM is like a small component of what XFCE does, because it manages you know, networking and all kinds of other stuff too, your desktop, um, whereas DWM only manages windows. And so if you really want to, and actually a lot of people do this, they they take XFCE and they rip out the window manager that's in that and they drop in something like DWM um, so they can get the tile uh, effects uh -huh. for managing your windows. All right. Uh-oh, somebody's in trouble. <laughs> Should I don't understand. Is it you, Steve? <laughs> I, you know... I haven't robbed a bank in a week, so I, I really don't think it's me. Only been a week? In a slow week, I guess. Yeah, you know, if they haven't caught me by now, you know, they just can't take a joke. Um, I use OpenBox mostly, and, um, you know, it's not as low memory as uh, DWM. But, I mean, if you look at the situation, almost everybody now has at least two gigabytes of RAM. So, I think OpenBox takes like 7 or 8 meg or maybe 16 meg or something like that. And DWM takes, you know, what, 2, 3, I don't know. But the point is, you know... It, they're all really low. Where you run into trouble is uh, XFCE takes something like, I think, 75 kilobytes, and uh, KDE takes, like, I think, uh, 100 gig or 100 meg or something like that. Or, and GNOME, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> And what happens on those on those piggy managers is they're not crisp when you hit the key keypad. There's a latency. It's it's only about a tenth or a twentieth of a second, but you notice it. It's not crisp. I mean, when you hit you know, David, when you hit a key, bang, it responds, right? It's absolutely no perceptible lag. Whereas with a lot of these things, you do get the lag. And then a lot of them, too, um, you get, they get unstable after a while. And these low memory ones don't get unstable. Yeah, there's that notorious known uh, memory leak for a while where if you just let it sit in, you'd end up with, three or four gigs of memory being used after, you know, eight hours. <laughs> I think they fixed things. My favorite was K-Mail. It, um, it used D-Bus in a way that uh, 
it would spawn off all sorts of debus dash da daemons. Okay? And some of these would start consuming 95% of your CPU. And back in those days, I didn't know how to get around using K-Mail. I thought I was stuck with it. I wrote a daemon that every two seconds, it would do a uh, PS uh, and grab out the uh, D-Bus daemons. If any of them was over 90%, and then, if, if any of them was over 90%, two times in a row, it would kill it. This was my solution. They were. Yeah. But finally, you know, they came out with K-Mail 2 with Nipomuk and Akinadi and... It, I did the conversion and it bombed. Thank goodness I had a spare. And I just said, whoa, that's it. No. You know, now instead of keeping my stuff in a nice little M-Box or Mailder, it's keeping part of it in this database called Akinati. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm a nice text kind of guy. I want to be able to go in there and edit the thing and grep the thing and do whatever I have to do to recover my data, enhance my data, report on my data, whatever. And uh, no, you're not storing any of my email on Akinati. I don't care if it's I don't care if it's the text or if it's the metadata. No. So that was when I switched over to my Dovecot slash uh, clause mail thing. Oh, another thing, back when I was young, I had um, I had this kind of glitchy computer, and it was crashing all the time and hanging all the time, so I replaced KDE with, um, oh, what was that thing called? LSD? No, um, it's a really nice looking, extremely low memory thing with no dependencies, doesn't work with anything. No, no, it's, it's one of those things, it's ancient, you can still use it, but, uh, TWM? No, because it, the interesting thing is, it had a built-in panel, and it looked it looked like Windows. Oh, uh, X X F V M or X F V W M or something like that. No, it's got like a bunch of letters in it. Hang on a sec. Let me go and look. Oh, wait a minute. Did he always say KV WM? No, it it sounded much less Linuxy than that. Windows Maker? Oh, Windows Maker? No, but you know, Window Maker, surprisingly, you know how good looking it is? It's very, very low memory. Lightweight 
high performance computer. I stub you out? Yep. I stub you out. That's it. Ah. That was the one that Puffy Linux used for a while, right? Who used it? I think Puffy. Puffy Linux? Could be. Well, except for its menuing system, it was spectacular. And of course, now. You can just substitute U menu and D menu, and you don't need their menuing system. That thing was nice, uh, and a very low RAM, and very snappy. So anyway, I replaced KDE with that thing. I only had 64 megabytes of RAM on this computer. You know, it was a long time ago, and all of a sudden, man, it just worked. Never hung up or anything. I mean, it had hardware problems, but the point is, KDE really ground into those hardware problems and made them happen more often. Well, guys, I'm going to have I'm going to have to check out because my daughter's leaving for Chicago. So uh, I'll see you guys next month. David, this was really, really good. Thank you so much. Um, can you guys just, can you guys discuss what we should present next meeting? Just discuss that while I'm gone. Um, cause I gotta go now. All right, Steve, have a good one. Talk to you guys later. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Well, David, that was a real good uh, presentation. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, no problem. So can yeah, anybody... That was, that was good. Yeah. And I think anything that uh, talks about uh, contributing to uh, open source is pretty good. So, Can anybody think of another... Do you have any other presentations you can uh, do for next month? Um, next month. So I won't be able to be here next month. Um, I'm traveling for work, but I could do something the month after. Okay. I guess isn't that helpful for this discussion? But <laughs> sure. That sounds good. What will it be? Does anybody else have a suggestion? Joe, you host a uh, GoLug website, don't you? I'm sorry, go ahead. You you host a GoLug website, right? Can't hear you, man. Yeah, for some um, reason, my... Go ahead. We couldn't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, you host the yes. GoLug, um, the GoLug website, don't you? Yeah. So, do you you not only do you run a web server, do you run a hosting company or something? No, it's just a it's just a hobby of mine. Oh, okay. Maybe if you could talk about that next month. Okay, sure. There we go. And if we have time, I, and if we have time, I could talk talk about uh, the, the the mail server, which we which we host our stuff. I mean, host our um, mailing list too. That would be interesting. I'd like to know about that. I I, I could do that. That's fine. That's cool. All right. Anybody have anything else?
I'm surprised Robert didn't hear. He'd want to do something on cryptocurrency. <laughs> that guy's real revolutionary when it comes to crypto. Is, isn't he on? Isn't that? Isn't Robert on? Are you here? No. Looks like he's muted. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I heard that. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, Robert. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm um, calling on you in a, in a um, accelerator program. Um, it's online, but it's, but it's put on by Y Combinator out of Silicon Valley. And, um, cool. yeah, if, if you get invited, they invite you out there for in person. That's a three-month event, too. And I think they put you up out there. So that, that would be pretty cool. Um, and I'm, I'm... Yeah, Y Combinator is Yeah. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. You know, I'm, I presented on my, my monetization system um, before here last time. And um, Y Combinator has started 5,000 startups. And I'm actually going after Y Combinator as a client. Might as well go big, right? If you're not going to shoot for the stars, don't, don't go. Amen. Um, um, but, yeah, this tool could enable, basically it provides web advertising, so every one of the 5,000 already existing startups can use the product, and they're presenting the startups continuously who all need, need desperately cheap advertising. So, I think why Combinator is the perfect candidate to, to sell them on this. And they're always pumping their startups to um, go out and find users to help them debug and test the product. So I'm going to ask them to put their money where their mouth is and help them debug the program themselves. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going, I'm going for the gold ring here. And... Uh, so it's pretty fun time. So it's, it's a 10 week online course. I've done two weeks of it. So I still got eight to go. But just the two weeks that I've done has been really growing for me. But thanks for the plug there, Max. <laughs> You're welcome, Robert. Oh, I, I want to tell, tell him about your nephew. Yeah. Okay. So, so one of the aspects of Nano Network is, you know, to monetize, monetize web traffic. And one of my visions would be to get students who are regularly creating um, work for school that normally just gets in the grade. So the idea is to take that content that they've already created, copy and paste it, and put it online as link based. And then for the students to convert that link page into advertising accounts, which basically then becomes like sponsorship for their either schoolwork or future projects they want to do. And it's basically free money because it's gotten, you know, they basically published their homework, which they wouldn't have gotten anything for. And so presented this at the other um, Linux Music Group meeting here in Winter Park. And Max's nephew was there. He's 14. And he just got on fire with it. And I told him, I said, you know, you're 14 and you can sell you all the other students in the school on this. And you'll be able to retire a millionaire by the time you graduate high school. So I'm pumping in students. Fortunately, he has a great uncle. Keep him down on earth, you know, um, keeping him from getting grand visions but uh so that's a that's one that's close to my heart getting getting these students on board with uh you know uh starting entre entrepreneurship while they're still in school with writing and uh, content production yeah and uh i had him create a website and uh he's still working on it but uh I put it in the chat in case anybody wanted to look at it. It's just he just started it and he's only using HTML with it so far. But he 
He created it in about a week of uh, me showing him how to put a few tags out. Okay. I'm, I'm all set. i got to get some emails out. Appreciate it. Good, great presentation. A lot right. of it was over my head. But <laughs> that's why you you guys are pros and I'm, I'm just a hacker. All right, Robert. Thanks for showing up. Excellent, David. We appreciate it, sir. Right. I guess I'll. I guess I'll oh. Yeah, no problem. I guess I'll talk to you guys uh, on IRC and email. All right. You have a good night. Thanks. All right, fellas. Anybody? Ha anybody have anything else? Not me. And I. Not me. Not me. All right. Well. Joe, we look forward to your presentation next month. I'll I'll send out the email to the uh, email list. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. All right, Enrique, you have something you want to add? That, uh, it was a great presentation, and I really enjoy it. I did too. Uh, I I don't work with Linux uh, very very much, but certainly. Uh, it, it took me uh, to the days when I was uh, when I was playing with it, and it was very funny that Steve was trying to 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 remember something that he he, he was he was mingled with. And well, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, uh, Max, for having this. Well, excellent, gentlemen. Uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and knock off two, and uh, nothing else. If there's nothing else, uh, I hope you guys have a good uh, have a good evening. All right, you too. All right, take it easy, John. Take it easy. All right, bye bye. All right, so that was a, a presentation that was done here at GoLog. Um, the actual uh, meeting place was is usually uh, somewhere in Central Florida, but lately we've been doing online uh, meetings until we found another physical location. And I apologize. Um, I started the video conference, or, or I started videotaping the the uh, meeting late um, because I was just I I just didn't pick up on it fast enough. Anyway, I hope all who uh, look at this video enjoy it. I hope that it comes out clear enough. I didn't get enough chance to test out um, the software before um, turning it on. But in either case, thank you very much for looking at this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe and you have a good day.